In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Salaamu Alaikum. Welcome to Islam. The Quran is the ultimate source of wisdom and guidance. It views this life as only a test during which we prepare for the hereafter and the eternal life to come. Those who understand its message are thus fully conscious of their responsibility their entire lives and are dedicated to working with full consciousness of God towards the goal of seeking the truth and sharing it with others. Muhammad Assad, who passed away in February of this year, 1992, was a scholar whose life best exemplified this mission. His life, which took him to many distant lands, was dedicated entirely to the service of Islam. He has left for us an outstanding legacy, a remarkable work on Islam, which will continue to help many seekers of truth through generations to come. In 1988, the Islamic Information Service traveled to Spain and was fortunate to get the last television interview of his life. What you are about to see is unedited footage which will give you an insight into this truly great scholar's life. Um, in your book, The Road to Mecca, you discuss the memories of your life and your childhood and then as you journeyed into Islam. For our viewers, could you tell us, where were you born? I was born in a city called Lvov, or Lemberg in German, in the eastern part of Austria, which was then Austria. It is no more now. And uh, I spent my earliest childhood there and later in Vienna until I left Austria as a grown-up young man. Were you, the, were you a member of a large family or uh, did you have many brothers and sisters? I had one brother and one sister. Brother, elder brother and younger sister. I was the middle one. And what about your relationship with your father and, and with your parents? Did uh, your father have an influence on your life? Yes, my father was an outstanding person with many scientific interests. He was himself an uh, advocate, but he had a great inclination towards physical sciences. And he had been dreaming in his childhood, in his youth, of becoming a scientist, but that was not possible for economic reasons, and he chose law and became a, a lawyer. But uh, we had often discussions with him, and uh, he was a man of very liberal views, although he felt himself as a Jew. He was not uh, so deeply interested in Judaism as such. He had a wider view. Also. Did your mother have a big influence in your life at all? Uh, no, she was extremely kind and loving, but uh, my intellectual stimulation came from my father. Did he have uh, uh, dreams for you, for your future and what you would do with your life? Uh, yes, he left it to me to choose what I wanted to do, and he was not very happy when I left the university after two years in order to uh, become a journalist. But still, he accepted it. Where did you attend university? Vienna. In Vienna. Yes. I studied philosophy and history of art and history in general. Uh, what made you desire, what made you want to become a journalist? did not make me desire, you see, I, when I was uh, 19 years old, nearly 20, I left uh, Vienna and went to Berlin on my own. Uh, I left the university. And since I had to fend for myself, I started looking for a job and got a job in a, a news agency. Uh, this was a semi-American agency, United Telegraph. And uh, so my journalism started. 
And later on, I was invited by an uncle of mine who was living, who was a psychiatrist and living in Jerusalem in charge of a mental hospital. <clears throat> he was unmarried and alone. And we had always a very close relation. He was the youngest brother of my mother. And he invited me to Jerusalem to stay with him for some time because he felt lonely. He was, uh, uh, he opposed the idea of Zionism and uh, he was more or less isolated within his community. Well, I went to Jerusalem and stayed with him for some months and there began my attraction to the Muslim world and through them to Islam. What was your political and philosophical view at the time you came to Jerusalem? My political views were nil. My philosophical views were uh, those of a young, inexperienced man, and I wouldn't like to boast about them today. But uh, I felt from the very first moment that uh, the aim of Jewish colonization of Palestine and doing thereby wrong to the Arabs was immoral. And I, was, I became averse to the idea of Zionism from the very first moment of my contact with it. And then I decided to take up my journalistic career, which had just started in Berlin before I left it. I wrote an article, made 10 copies of it, and sent it to 10 newspapers in Europe. Nine of them didn't answer, and the tenth, this was the Frankfurter Zeitung, probably the most important newspaper uh, at that time in, on the continent of Europe, accepted it and offered me the job of uh, their special correspondent in the Middle East, which I accepted and began to write for them. Then I returned after, uh, uh, yes, I went uh, on a further journey for the newspaper to Syria, to Iraq. Um, what were you writing uh, about? I was writing mostly <coughs> about people, about my feeling of uh, people, the way of they looked upon life and how they lived. That interested me more than political constellations of the moment. And uh, apparently the, these articles were well received and very soon I had a name in the German press. When I returned to uh, Germany after an absence of two years, I was... I, wrote a book on those past journeys in German, which was called Unromantisches Morgenland, it means the non-romantic East, where I discussed, among other things, the idea of Zionism and question of Egyptian independence and so forth. Then, uh, after a few months, I was sent out on another very long journey, which took me years, went again to Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and returned via Central Asia and Russia to <laughs> Europe. You were coming back from Afghanistan. Yes, but uh, during that journey, there developed great, uh, in me, great attraction to Islam, which came first through my liking the Arabs in Palestine and Syria. I found them open and uh, pleasant to deal with. And gradually I learned Bazari Arabic, could talk to some extent with them, and became interested in what they thought, what they imagined. And so I came upon Islam and started reading about it became more and more interested. When you learned Arabic, was it the language of the people first before you learned classic Arabic? Of course. I learned my Arabic in the, in the souk, in the bazaar, just picked up, as most of my languages were. Yeah. And uh, 
Then on my second long trip to the Muslim, country, Muslim world, I was in Afghanistan, in Herat, Western Afghanistan, and I rode in uh, late autumn over the Hindu Kush mountains to Kabul. It was a journey of about 20 or 25 days on horseback, very hard journey. And uh, on one occasion, my horse lost a shoe. So I was obliged to go off my road to a village nearby and had the shoe replaced by a smith. It happened so that the governor, district governor there, learned of the visit of a foreigner and invited me to spend the evening and the night in his house. He was a very friendly man. At that time I spoke Persian fluently after uh, nearly two years in Persia and in Afghanistan. So the conversation was easy. We were sitting after dinner and talking about various things and naturally we came to talk about Islam. And I spoke quite bluntly to him. I told him, you Muslims are a very strange people. You have the best ethical guidance possible in the Quran. You had the best guide in your prophet Muhammad. How is it that you have abandoned the ways recommended in the Quran and by the prophet and have fallen into such a decadence. Why are you acting in so many ways against the precepts of the Quran? And so it went on discussing. At the end he looked at me and he said, you are a Muslim. I was quite astonished and I said, no, it never occurred to me to be a Muslim. I am not. He says, oh yes, you are a Muslim, only you don't know it. One day you will come to know it. And these were prophetic words. Later on, when I returned from that journey a few months later, I really became a Muslim. <clears throat> uh, could you describe for us the actual event of your becoming a Muslim and how that took place? Yes. After my return from my second long journey to the Muslim world, I was living in Berlin and started reading the Quran in translation because my Arabic was still insufficient to read it in its original language. And uh, one day I, I was uh, discussing it, of course, often with my first wife, who was a German, older than me, and who was equally interested in Islam. And one day we were traveling in the underground in Berlin. And this was in the year 1926. It was a year of great prosperity in Central Europe after uh, years of misery and inflation. And all people were well-dressed, people whom the, the, who were in the underground train together with us, well-dressed and well-fed apparently, but it appeared to me that their faces were not happy. And I looked from one to the other and saw there is unhappiness in these people. You are, they are oppressed. And I turned to my wife, who was, by the way, a painter and accustomed to observe faces. And I said, what do you think of the faces of these people? And she said, they are unhappy. Same impression she had. When I came home, I could not explain to myself why it was, because, as I said, <clears throat> it was a prosperity year in Central Europe. I happened <coughs> to find an open copy of the German translation of the Quran on my desk, which I had left before going out. <coughs> And I took it up, and the first which, my, uh, which I, my eye came upon 
was a sura el hakumu takasro, which in German is you are obsessed by, uh, I'm translating this now into English, you are obsessed by striving for more and more until you go down to your graves. <laughs> oh, you would, if you would but see it, and again, if you would see, and then you will see one day that you are in hell, and on that day you will be asked, what did you do with the boon of life? <clears throat> it came to my mind that this is the illustration of our present modern life. People are unsatisfied, wanting more and more material goods, and, get, and are unhappy, and they do not see that they are living in hell now. And God says in this verse, in this uh, surah, one day you will see hell with the eye of certainty, and then you will be asked, what did you do with the boon of life? Hmm. And I was so struck by it, by this coincidence of finding this surah as an explanation of what I had seen previously in the underground train, I told myself, how is it possible that a man living 1400 years ago had composed a book describing the situation of today, showing us what people feel now? No human being, not the greatest genius could do such a thing, and especially not an Arab who was unlettered who did not know anything beyond the confines of the Arab world. No, this book must be inspired. And inspired by whom? It is, then it became, I became certain that it was a revealed book. Next day, I went to the head of the Muslim community in Berlin, whom I had known superficially from before. It was an uh, Indian Muslim gentleman by name of Abdul Jabbar Khairi. And I told him, I want to become a Muslim. What shall I do? He said, it's very simple. Give me your hand. And I gave him my hand. He said, repeat after me, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, which I did. He says, you are a Muslim now. I said, good, accept it. And then he said, wait, your name is Leopold, Leo, lion, lion. In Arabic it is Assad. Let your name be Muhammad Assad. It never occurred to me before to change my name, but since he suggested it, I accepted it. And I said, let it be Muhammad Assad. And so I became Muhammad Assad from that day on. That was in September 1926. Thing that you um, you knew intuitively that the, an Arab could not have have intellectually an Arab anybody Plato, if he had lived at that time, could not have composed the book describing the situation two thousand years, uh, fourteen hundred years later. No, not the greatest genius, Arab or non-Arab could do it himself, by himself. And later I found in the Quran many such indications of wisdom which could not come from a human mind. You know? um, at that point, did it inspire you to go on to other, to other things Islamically? Oh, did that then, I started, that point? then I started uh, learning Arabic. And uh, some months later, I went to Egypt, stayed for a time there, later on, together with my wife, who became a Muslim together with me. And then we went on Hajj to Mecca. And my wife fell ill just before the Hajj, and after the Hajj she died there, which was a great shock to me. And I remained uh, for some weeks alone in 
in a room and didn't want to see anybody. And it gradually developed. Then I met the king, king's son first, and then the king Abdulaziz, for whom, by the way, I had a letter of introduction from the head of the Muslim community in Berlin. And the king invited me to stay in his realm, which I stayed, and I stayed for six years without interruption there in Arabia, and traveled all over uh, Saudi Arabia and through the deserts. And Could you <clears throat> tell us something about those six years? Yes. Uh, in Mecca, when I met the king, King Abdulaziz in mm -hmm. Saud, he invited me to go with him to Riyadh by car. They were going by cars already at that time. I asked his permission to go a roundabout way over the northern part of Saudi Arabia on a riding dromedary. Because I told him, I don't want to mount a car in Mecca and a few days afterwards land in Riyadh without having seen really anything of your country. If you allow me, I will travel on camel's back. And the king agreed to it. And I was f outfitted I, with uh, riding camels and a companion who later became my companion for many years, for all the six years. And I traveled all over the north and center of Saudi Arabia, came to Riyadh, and then afterwards again to the south and right and left, and spent the six years uh, actually in almost all parts of the kingdom lived with Bedouins and slept in tents and, and in the open air in the desert. And it was a wonderful experience and wonderful time. Did the dangers or problems that you encountered during this time? There were no particular dangers except one time when I lost my way in the desert and almost died of thirst. I described that in this book. Islam at the cross, uh, the, uh, the road to Mecca. And, uh, but otherwise there were no dangers because under the reign of Abdulaziz ibn Saud, Saudi Arabia was the most peaceful country in the world, and it is to this day. Did these experiences bring you closer to God in any sense? To yes. Living in the desert and traveling through the desert brings one closer to God. This is when I began to understand <clears throat> while all monotheistic religions started in the desert. It was the feeling of absolute loneliness, f loneliness facing God. And uh, the feeling of insignificance in the midst of nature and dependence on one central power. Therefore, I believe this is the reason why the ancient Hebrews came to um, the concept of one God and why Islam was born in Arabia and not in more fertile countries. What about your experience with the Bedouins? Bedouins, you see, are very often misunderstood in Europe. Many Westerners regard them as uncultured barbarians, which is not at all true. The Bedouins had, until very recently, a very clear-cut culture of their own. There was such a thing as Bedouin culture which they carried with them for since centuries. For instance, poetry was a thing living in the Bedouins. They not only knew and recited poetry, they could compose poetry. 
once I happened to be guest of uh, the governor of northern uh, Saudi Arabia. He was, by the way, the brother-in-law of the king. And we were sitting uh, in outside his palace and uh, surrounded by many people. Some of them brought judicial cases before the uh, Amir, the governor, to decide. And he gave his judgment in this case, in that case, to the satisfaction of all parties. And one Bedouin was sitting next to me, and he turned to me and said, did you see that? Did you hear it? And he recited a poem in the praise, which I later learned, uh, was by Mutanabi, a great Arab poet, in, uh, in praise of uh, Saif al-Dawla, a Muslim ruler. And in that poet he said, he spoke of the greatness of this man who was able to judge uh, between people and so on. And it occurred to me, where in the West could you find a company of unlettered people who would quote, let us say, Shakespeare to you, or Goethe, or so? Impossible. In Europe, in the America, culture is reserved to a particular class of educated people, while in Arabia, among the Bedouins, it was spread throughout the whole nation. There is, the Bedouins were as much connected with pre-Islamic poetry as any professor in a university might be. So this, this uh, was an extraordinary experience, showing that these people are not barbarians, but they are inheritors of a very ancient civilization. And I began to understand why Islam had to grow up among Arabs in Arabia. This was the proper fertile ground for the spread of a religion like Islam, based on the concept of one God, of uh, uh, everything being within his creation, and so on. It seems like all of your experience just made that more profound, from the, the dangers of the desert and the loneliness of the desert to the beauty of the Bedouin poetry. Yes, of course, are, these, these are connected. It is uh, precisely an uh, enjoyment to enter a Bedouin tent and be received hospitally. Of course, hospitality is, is part of the Bedouin character. With the, I mean, it is inseparable from the Bedouin character. And then being addressed in verses by the host, in verses which were impromptu, uh, composed, suiting the occasion. And this happened very often to me. What kind of a person was King Abdulaziz? Huh? What kind of a man was King Abdulaziz? He was one of the most outstanding men I have known. He was, he, I mean, the story of his life and how he regained the lost kingdom of his ancestors is well known, and I have discussed it in this book, The Road to Mecca. But his personality was uh, absolutely outstanding. He was very tall, perhaps 7'4 or 7'5, I don't know exactly the exact figure, but he was very tall. I was taller at that time than I am now because my back was straight. And when I greeted him and in an Arab way kissed him on the tip of his nose and his forehead, I had to stand on my toes while he bent down to me. <laughs> and uh, he was not only a great uh, person, but a great ruler. He established a kingdom which had never existed before, a kingdom in which uh, there was and is to this day absolute public security, nowhere else to be found in the world. 
And uh, it was a kingdom, in spite of not having a written constitution, a kingdom that survived many shocks. When Abdulaziz died, his eldest son Saud became king, and afterwards he was deposed and died. Then King Faisal, the younger son, became king, and he was murdered. And then after him, his younger brother, Khalid, became king, and so forth to the present time. And all these shocks did not change anything in the structure of the political structure of the country and left it undisturbed. No other country in the world, I think, could have survived such uh, uh, deaths and occurrences without getting out of kilter entirely. What kind of a Muslim was he? Ibn Saud? Mm. He was a very strict Muslim of the so-called Wahhabi persuasion, which is a misnomer, of course, because it goes back to a scholar of the 18th century, Muhammad Abdul Wahhab, who was uh, a very orthodox scholar following the school of Ahmad, Abdul, Ahmad Ibn Hanbal. But, uh, I mean, Ibn Saud was a very orthodox, strict Muslim, and at the same time, he had a very definite sense of humor, which made his uh, behavior not only acceptable, but delightful. I remember one day, we went out in cars into the desert in Riyadh, and something happened uh, to the engine of the car in which we were traveling. We had to stop, and the driver, who was a Baluchi, many years, Ibn Saud's driver, he bent down to uh, look into the engine. And while he bent down, a packet of cigarettes fell from his pocket on the ground. And you must know that in this Wahhabi, so-called Wahhabi uh, uh, persuasion, Tobacco is absolutely prohibited. So the men became flustered. And the king saw it, and the, this driver obviously expected an outburst from the king who was standing next to him. But the king looked at this and then turned away and said, Muhammad uh, um, Assad, look at those mountains there. You see, this mountain goes like this and like this. Change the subject. <laughs> And the, the man picked up his cigarettes and hid them in his pocket. And I saw that Ibn Saud had a sense of humor which will outweigh his severity and his seriousness very often. And there were many such instances which I experienced. As I said, I spent six years with him not always in his presence, but off and on between my travels in Arabia and very much. So they, I think it was one of the best periods of my life. What was the, your experience when you first uh, went to the Kaaba? Difficult to describe. I had a feeling of awe, knowing that uh, it is the centermost point of Islam towards which all Muslims bow down, bow down in prayer. And the, in one corner of the Kaaba is the black stone, which, according to many Europeans, is being worshipped by Muslims, which is, of course, untrue. This black stone is... Uh, regarded as the only remnant of the original temple built by Abraham in that place, temple to one God. And it was kissed by the Prophet and all Muslims who visit Mecca and perform their circumambulation around the Kaaba kiss the stone also. It is not the sign of worship, 
But I give an explanation of it in this book, The Road to Mecca, which I think is acceptable to all Muslims. The Prophet knew that all people would uh, repeat his actions, especially during worship, in future generations. When he kissed the stone, he knew that all Muslims who would come to Mecca and uh, visit the Haram, the, the Holy Temple, and circumambulate the Kaaba, would kiss the stone also. So it is symbolically, he kissed all Muslims who would come after him and would touch the stone with their lips. And every Muslim who kisses it, kisses as it were the Prophet and all Muslims who were before him and all who would be after the, him. So this symbolic kiss of the black stone has the, an importance stressing the brotherhood and the imperishable brotherhood of the Muslim community, of all Muslims. So did you feel that when you were there? Yes. I felt that, and I think that this is the only explanation, possible explanation, of the prophets kissing the stone. This is uh, it's narrated that Omar ibn al-Khattab, the second caliph, after the death of the prophet, he led the pilgrimage to Mecca, and then he stopped before the black stone and addressed it loudly so that all people could, could hear it. You are only a stone, neither from heaven nor from hell. You are nothing but a lifeless stone. And I would not kiss you unless I had seen the prophet kiss you. And, but as he did it, I do it too. And he kissed the stone. And that is the habit of all Muslims. He understood it perfectly well. He knew the meaning of it. He said, this is a stone, nothing but a basalt stone, black basalt, remaining from the original temple, narrated uh, by tradition, as the original temple built by Abraham on this place. You must have visited mm. the Kaaba many times. Was many. your first visit the most uh, profound visit, or, or were others more so? How do, you how do you feel each time you go back? You must have visited it many there, times. There, was, there were differences. You see, in my time, in my early years in Arabia, pilgrimage was very much less uh, frequented than in our days. Now, there were no cars, no aeroplanes. People were coming by ship to Jeddah, and then by camel or on donkey or on foot going to Mecca. <clears throat> so there were comparatively much less pilgrims than now. Now there are millions always. So it happens, it did happen at that time, that when you sat opposite the Kaaba, in the early hours before dawn, say at three o'clock in the morning or so, so there were practically no people there. But there was never a time, never I have seen a time, when there was not at least one person going around the Kaaba. <coughs> Always there were some people, and once or twice I saw one person, one man going around the Kaaba. And one day I was sitting there just before dawn, waiting for the Adhan, for the call to prayer, for the Fajr prayer, when I felt really, felt myself opposite the house of God, Spiritually speaking, I know that God does not inhabit any house. God does not inhabit any space or place because he is unlimited and he is everywhere. But one had the feeling of absolute positive sanctity of this place. And this was the strongest experience I had. You've had so many experiences in your life. Um, after you left Saudi, uh, are there any other experiences that really stand out in your mind? Many, but I can't recall them offhand. You see. What uh, was your next journey when you left Saudi? Next journey, you see, I was in. Uh, I was uh, persuaded by some 
Muslim Indian, Indian Muslim friends whom I met, with whom I became friends in Mecca, to visit uh, India because they said this is one of the largest Muslim communities in the world and you must come to know it. And so I decided to go for a few months uh, visit to India. And I went there and out of the few months became many, many years. And I stayed there due, uh, because I met uh, a gr an outstanding Muslim thinker and philosopher, Muhammad Iqbal, with whom I became friends and who persuaded me to remain in India and to work for the establishment of Pakistan. And he was the father of this idea, actually. What influence has your wife had on your journey? On my journey? Mm -hmm, through life. Uh, journey through life, <clears throat> yes. Uh, she was the best companion I can imagine entirely understanding what I was aiming at, what I am aiming at, and helping me in many innumerable ways. Actually, when I was started, before I started on translating and comment, uh, the Quran and commenting upon it, it was her suggestion that I should do this work. And while I was doing it, we were discussing every verse which I translated. She does not know Arabic enough to uh, read it in original, but we were discussing in a translation and trying to polish it up to the best of our ability. And she was collaborating with me without interruption the whole time. Without her, I would probably never have done this work. So this is one aspect of influence. And in general, I must confess that I am a somewhat lazy person. <laughs> and uh, many times I wanted to give up a work on which I was engaged. And it was her urging that kept me to continue and continuing it. And I am grateful to her and always will be grateful to her, although she will herself out of modesty, probably denying what I am saying. But without her, I would not have done a quarter of what I Was she made. born a Muslim? No. She became a Muslim before, just a few months before we met in New York. She was reading herself. She was not satisfied with her Catholic background. <clears throat> And uh, at the age, from the age of uh, 14, 15, she started reading about various other religions. And finally, she started reading about Islam. It always comes in the West last, because there is a prejudice against it. And found it, in some ways, immediately attractive. And since she was, uh, she was at that time in the uh, State Department and uh, she was uh, part of the uh, American-U.S. Uh, delegation to the United Nations in charge of the Secretariat, or the Secretariat of the Mission. And in the United Nations, she met many Muslims, especially Muslims from Pakistan, who, with whom she could share thoughts in English. And she became gradually convinced that Islam is her way. And she became a Muslim just a short time before we met. And we met, as a matter of fact, in Pakistan House in New York. If you had to say, what, what impact has Islam had on you in a spiritual sense? How has it changed your life? It is very difficult to say. <clears throat> it is given a center of, uh, an ideological center to my life. And that is, I suppose, the main thing which it did. It is, it has colored all my 
uh, thoughts and my endeavors, whatever they are worth for, and has made me spend years of my life on working uh, on Islamic problems. If you had to say that your life had a purpose, that you were born with a destiny of a purpose in this life, what would you consider that destiny and purpose to have been? I would say the destiny is that that has passed and is known to us. This is precisely the point. We don't know the future. We don't know what destiny may bring to us. But we know, as Muslims, that whatever happened to us in the past had to happen and could not have been otherwise. Because, obviously, it was God-willed, and since it was God-willed, it could not have taken another course. We are uh, believing in predestination backward, what has happened in the past. We don't believe in predestination as regards the future, because we are offered free will and choice. So we are trying, in accordance, in accordance with our best knowledge and understanding, to do the right thing, if we try to do the right thing. Were you born into this life to accomplish a task? And if so, what was that I task? I don't know that. That is, that is not for me to answer whether I was born to accomplish a task or not. This is for God to decide. I have tried in my life to do certain things, some of them were satisfying to me, about others I am unsatisfied or not fully satisfied. But the purpose of my life, what is the final purpose of my life was and is, God alone knows. You're living in Spain now, and what lessons can Muslims draw from the fate of their Arab brothers in Spain? What, in your opinion, was the cause of the downfall of Muslims in Spain? The cause of the downfall was, the, first of all, the political disunity among the various groupments in Spain, split up into states, <clears throat> the decadence of uh, uh, social life, loss of uh, real Islamic impetus gradually, as in all over the Muslim world, <coughs> but mainly <coughs> it was uh, the political disunity and rivalry between the various uh, states or statelets there in Muslim Spain. Had this not been the case, the whole Spain would have remained Muslim to this day. So what would your advice be then? What would be your, um, um, what can we learn from what happened in Spain as Muslims? As Muslims we should, <laughs> I don't think that Spain has a particular lesson which other parts of the Muslim world don't offer, but I believe that first of all we should safeguards the consciousness of one Muslim community, brotherhood of Muslims. Secondly, we should try to live up to what Islam teaches us and not be only nominally Muslims. Not think that the uh, observation of a few rituals makes us Muslims alone, uh, without we must have give our life Islamic contents. And that is different in every person, in every group of persons, in every community, every part, different part of the world. In short, we must go back to Islam. We have estranged ourselves to some extent from it. Thank you so much, Mr. Assad, for sharing your life with us in this way. Uh, we appreciate this very much. You're having us in your home. It was a pleasure for me, and more than a pleasure, a duty which I hope I have absolved in some way. <laughs>